he, he began to talk to me. He added these two verses as I begin to read, beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints for the next verse starts with the word for the great word there is for this cause on this account for this reason so what he just said in verse three is based on the motive behind verse three is what he says in verse four and actually verse five for there are certain men crept in unawares crept in where the church who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of our God and lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ I will therefore put you in remembrance though ye once knew of this is it what's the word is it of this in your text because somehow in my text it came after this okay though you once knew of this how that the lord having saved the people out of the land of egypt afterward destroyed them that believe not now that is pretty disturbing because he saved the Jew. I'm charging you with earnestly contending for the faith that was once delivered to the saints because there are certain men crept in unawares into the church who is leading the church away from the specifics of my word and just as I ended up having to destroy those I say God Egypt that's the concern we have now now of course we Pentecostals are really Baptists because we really do believe once they always say don't we we don't believe we can backslide, can we? Oh, we think you only backslide if you go to the adultery or rob the bank or kill somebody. We think that's the only kind of backslide there is. Except the scripture says the backslider in the heart is filled with his own ways. Or if I can paraphrase, the backside of the heart is filled with his own traditions and ideas of how this is supposed to be, yeah. rather than what the word says. Yeah. Now I'm 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 always more than fine when the crowd's small. It's just fewer people to get in trouble with. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm here if the Lord wants a thousand to hear it. That's his business. If he wants close a small group to hear it, because this is this is really a <laughs> this is a very we were at the airport this morning, my grandson, my youngest grandchild. Joel's youngest child. We were watching some planes take off, and he said, Why is it some take a long time for them to get up? And others take off pretty quick. We talked about that a little while. So tonight we're, we're on a long runway. It's taking a little time because. It's really an awkward place to be in. And you got people you love, you've devoted your whole life to being in their fellowship and part of them. 
and then the word of God begins to show us that we're not really where we think we are. Because in the Pentecost I raised that that's still in existence today, if you're doing the do's and not doing the don'ts, you come to the church faithfully, pay your tithes, then you're saved. Would someone please show me that in the Bible? The Bible says by the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. I'm not asking for two or three scriptures. I'm, to, I'm asking for one verse that says, if you do the do's, you don't do the don'ts, you come to church faith, pay your tithes, obey your pastor, and look simply at that you're saved. And yet, in the Pentecost, I was raised that probably 90% more of our preaching covers getting people to do those things. Yeah. And if I can't find in the Bible where if I do those things, I'm saved, then why is that the focus? I'm not preaching it's okay to do the don'ts and not do the do's. That's not what I'm preaching. We Pentecostals have become very much religious. We have the expectations that people have to perform in order to be saved. I don't come to church to be saved. I come to church because I am saved. I don't do the do's, not do the don'ts, because that's what saves me. I do the do's and don't do the don'ts because I am saved. I pay my tithes to be saved. I pay my tithes because I am saved. And, you know, I don't know about up here, but in Maryland and in Pennsylvania, other states, but Pennsylvania, now, you talk about the separation of Satan. There are thousands upon thousands of Amish people that make us look like streetwalkers. And I'm not trying to be crude, rude, or offensive, especially those who have young people. But it's the truth. My wife and I were uh, had gone up into Pennsylvania a couple of weeks ago and we were coming back and she wanted to come back a different way. So we came back on the two lane road, driving through the hills of the agricultural area of northern Maryland. And she says, this looks just like Pennsylvania. True. I said, but there's a difference. These farms have electricity. They have cars in the parking lot. They have tractors. If you were in Pennsylvania, there would be no tractors. It would be an electric line. And of course, the other difference is how separated those folks are. And it sounds like I am being negative about those things. I am not. I have a problem. <clears throat> I really have a problem. The problem is, I don't believe anything anybody teaches or says that I can't find for them. Right, man. right, it's good. And you sweet folks are nodding your head. Well, I've got some questions to ask you. I'd like you to tell me what you have first, where you found in the book. Thank you. 
but your preacher's here. I won't let you raise your hand, but how many of you preach sermons? Anybody know where the word sermon came from? It's not the Bible. It comes from the Latin word sermo, which was used to describe the content of a homily in Catholic masses back in the fifth and sixth century. I don't preach it. And if we're the bride of Christ, just trying to make a point here to tell you why. And if we're the bride of Christ and we're gathered together with, with all that are part of the bride of Christ and we're here to fellowship with our husband and we call it service. Now, it's very obvious that my wife's a good cook. <laughs> I didn't get this way eating in restaurants. So I've been heard this story told you to tell it better than me. When I was married, I weighed 181 pounds. She had a cookbook for four people. All the recipes were for four. Mm. And she didn't feel like dividing all of those recipes and the fractions of those ingredients in half. And my mother was a research scientist because she never threw anything away and she was trying to see how much, how many different kinds of mold she could grow in a refrigerator. So I ended up with a strong aversion to leftovers. Yeah. So I have a wife cooking for four. I don't eat any leftovers. And this is the first time in my life I buy the groceries. And I gained 10 pounds the first month. And to this day, the absolute 100% truth, sitting at her table, it's my favorite thing to do when it comes to food. Only reason I eat something else is when I just thought we were going to all the trouble. Literally. Well, I appreciate her doing that. But if she told me that she was doing that out of some obligation of service to me because I'm her husband, she would cook another meal for me. <laughs> Literally, she would never, I'd never eat another meal for me until her attitude changed. Is if you're doing this out of some sense of obligation and service, no thank you. I really need PBJs, I can make those. Somebody, somebody tell me where the scripture is that says it's a sin not to go to church. Seriously. Where's book chapter and verse for a sin and not go to church? Huh? Oh, yes. Yes. Where's book chapter and verse for that? Well, I can tell you where it came from. Just uh, type in Google, is it sin not go to church? You see all the Catholic websites that come up. And the Catholics have been teaching for hundreds of years that it is a mortal sin. Not a venal sin, which is sin, but it's you, you, you're not going to go to purgatory for people. That's a whole thing, right? It's a mortal sin to not go to mass. Now, the Protestants gave up the Pope. 
They gave up, gave up worship and marriage. But they didn't give up all that. The Pentecostals were Protestants that got the Holy Ghost. We gave up a few things, but we kept every bit of that. We never went back to the Bible to see what it said. You say we should come together? Absolutely, we should come together. Let's come together with a biblical attitude and spirit. I had a question for you. If the biggest Catholic church in your city somehow got the revelation and tonight they all got baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost and tomorrow and from then on they preached Acts 238 and one God but continue to practice everything else they do would that be okay with you? Why? Because it's the stuff that is not the Bible. Wait, what is the matter? We're going to condemn them for doing things that's not the Bible. We don't even know what the stuff we do is in the Bible. Oh, Jesus. Where's the Bible? Is the body of Christ supposed to come together? Yes. Because the church is both the body of Christ and the bride of Christ. We're supposed to come together. <laughs> I've had people say to me, well, what about Hebrews 10 25? Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together in the manner of so, and so much more. See that they approach it. I said, Do you really want to use that verse? Do you really want to, you want to use that verse as the one that says we have to go to church? Then I want to know how many days a week and how many times a day you're having church. Because if you believe Jesus is coming, you're supposed to be having more services than you've ever had before. If that's the way you're going to apply that verse, and if you're not doing that, you just cancel it out from you using for it to be the verse that commands you out you're obligated to get together. The Bible is a real problem, folks. The Bible is going to ruin more good sermons you've ever heard in your life. Because you hear something, and boy, it sounds so good, and then you go look into the Bible to find out where that was. You can't find it. Now, I know, I know, it sounds like it. It's just tearing down. I'm not tearing, trying to tear it. I'm just trying to get. No, I'm not trying to do anything. I'm trying to obey God. I'm trying to do what He told me to do. He made it very clear to me on Friday morning, January the seventh, that this was what He was going to use me to do in 2022. I've always done some of it, but this is very focused. Okay. And <laughs> let's do that. Let's do that. Okay. We say to the Trinitarian, you get baptized in the name of Jesus. They said, no, 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 no. It's, uh, you baptize in the name of the Father's Okay. All right. But the Bible says, here, 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 here. It's supposed to be in Jesus' name. And then they say, it doesn't matter. We go, yes, it does. We're supposed to do it exactly like the Bible says. So that only applies to water baptism. Seriously, yeah. that only applies to water baptism. That's the only thing we're supposed to do it exactly like the Bible says. If you ask licensed ministers, I'm not speaking about anybody else. If you ask licensed ministers of the United Pentecostal Church, 
Are you apostolic? The major reaction is going to be yes. And then you say, prove it. Well, we baptize in Jesus' name. We believe in one God. Really, that's what it takes to be apostolic. That's being apostolic? No, sir. No, sir. So, I have a question for you. Jude 3, if you don't mind again, that's chapter 1, verse 3. Beloved, I gave it all the diligence to write unto you the common salvation that was needful for me. And the Greek is literally this there was a necessity put upon me, an urgent necessity put upon me to exhort you to to strongly encourage you with authority, to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. Brother Wright, what you're doing is this is divisive. No, this is contending for the faith. It's contending for the faith. Notice, please, what I'm contending for. I'm not contending for faith. Faith between you and God. The book says we're to earnestly contend for the faith. That changes everything. The faith is an all inclusive term or expression that applies to everything that is involved in our walk with God. Everything. Not just our doctrine. But our relationship with God, our, our, our walk with God, our prayer lives, our, our, the way we do church. Now, I didn't do church. I mean, church is a noun. I don't know how you do church, but if you're traditional, you can do church. But if you're biblical, you can't do church, but we do church, right? Right. So, or how about this one? So you, you probably never heard this before, but I was raised that you're supposed to live for God, work for God. Yeah. Anybody ever heard it before? Yeah, right. I heard it so many times. I would be richer than, uh, than the Tesla guy if I had $1,000 for every time I heard a preacher say, live for God, work for God in my 76 years. I'm really not exaggerating. I that. That's not only not in the Bible, it is diametrically opposed to the teachings of the It's religion, it's not relationship. Lord said, if I need anything, I wouldn't tell you. Tell me what we can do for him. Die. Want to do something for him? Die. Get out of the way. Let him have your life. Let him run. Galatians 2 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ liveth in me. So rather than me living for God, I'm supposed to get out of the way so God can do the living through me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, right? Isn't that way it says it? Okay. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, not by faith in the Son of God. The Greek, Greek preposition for in is not in the Greek text. The Greek preposition for, or Greek word for the preposition of is in the Greek text. What's the difference? Of is a prepositional phrase of possession. Whose faith is it that I'm living by? Not mine. The Son of God's faith. When I get out of the way, 
by the grace of God. And he's the one living in me through me. And he's the one ministering through me. It's his faith ministry through me. And who's got the greater faith? Me or him. We say it was a ridiculous question. Must not be too ridiculous because we're all stuck on using that faith. So he said, we should earnestly contend for the faith. There you go. That was once delivered unto the saints. The Greek there is very literal. I can show you. I could. I'm not going to feel right now. But you can do it. Look it up. Look up the Amplified. Look up uh, the Amplified version. Look up the Weiss uh, Expanded Translation of the Testament. I mean, there's several in there. You can look this up. Okay? And, and translate it this way. The faith that was once and for all time. It's not a progressive thing. There was a time, a place, when God delivered the faith to the saints. And there are certain men crept in unawares that have been undermining that faith. And we're supposed to contend for that faith. Well, I have a question for you. When was that? When was that? Matthew 28, beginning with verse 18. The Lord said, all power, in the Greek word, there's not dunamis, it's section C, which is authority. All authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. Therefore is a, is a conclusive conjunction that joins verse 18 with verse 19 and 20. So verses 19 and 20 are based upon what he said in verse 18. All authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. Well, God's got power too. Yes, the devil has power. He doesn't have authority. Authority is what makes the difference. Luke 10, 19, don't go there. I said, stay here, if you don't mind. Luke 10, 19, Jesus said, behold, King James says, well, behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. The Greek there is not power, it's authority. Okay. So he says, all power or all authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. So everything that's about that Jesus is about to say is based upon the fact that all authority is given unto him. Go ye therefore, and of course, in our language today, we would say, therefore, go ye. Doesn't make a difference, in my opinion. Maybe it, maybe it would emphasize a little bit more than what's about to follow is based on what was said, but I'm not fussing with it. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, What's the punctuation mark in that verse after the word Holy Ghost? It's a full colon. Let me tell you what it's not. It's not a period. A period would say that verse is a sentence. But any kind of punctuation, comma, semicolon, or colon, let you know that it's only part of a sentence. That what is following after that is a part of a sentence. Now, if you're going to, if you're going to, excuse the terminology, bet your eternity on half a sentence, that's really foolish, isn't it? Especially when the other half of the sentence forces you to translate the first half in a very specific way, which is not currently being done. 
by millions and millions of people. <laughs> there is no other document known to man that people put more emphasis on parts of sentences than the Bible. Now, verse 20 says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Here's the beautiful, beautiful thing about all this. The word teach in verse 19 is the word that speaks of the act of teaching and the purpose of teaching is to teach for the purpose of making disciples. Verse 20 starts with the word that tells you what you're supposed to be teaching. That Greek word is applied, is specifically referencing content. You have to be hungry to be a part of this, especially three or four sections. You have to be hungry because this stuff makes you really uncomfortable. I've had people tell me, Brother Ryan, it just feels like you're taking everything out of me, all in a little ball, tossing the trash can. I'm not doing that. I don't have the right to do that. I'm just asking you scriptures, asking you for scriptures for what you believe. We're very comfortable. Why are we so comfortable? We've always done it. Is, does that make it right? You, you understand that's why they crucified Jesus? Because he challenged the stuff they were comfortable with and the way they'd always done it? And who was it that crucified Jesus. It wasn't the Romans. They were, uh, Pilate, Pilate made it very crystal clear. He wasn't in favor of doing it. But they, the Jews, the, the traditionalists, the people of God, they were God's people until the day of Pentecost. They said to Pilate, if you don't kill him, we're going to tell Caesar that you're tolerating people Preaching about another God ever other than him. These are Jews. They didn't believe that Caesar was God, but they used that man's false doctrine against him to manipulate him into doing their will. So before you become anti-Jewish, you know you got a slight problem with that because the 12 apostles were all Jewish. So you're going to throw all the Jews out. You have to throw them out too. And of course, <laughs> oh, this is, this, this is a whole other subject. If you want to look at the contention that Paul addressed numerous times in the epistles that he gives as the backstory for what went on in the book of Acts, what you find is the Christians, the Jews who became Christians, only wanted to add Christianity to their Judaism. And they wanted everybody else to become Christian Jews just like them. And of course, their real problem was Paul was their number one advocate till he got saved. And then he got a revelation. Who taught you? Who taught Paul his doctrine? Huh? 
Hello? Who did? Jesus. He did not go to Jerusalem for them teaching. He went to Arabia, and it's called, I can't find this exact terminology in the Bible, but I've heard it for years. He went, he spent two or three years on the backside of the desert. I forget that. It, 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 it was like, I think it was three years. He went to Jerusalem and talked to Peter only. And then it was like another 10, 13 years before he came back and talked to everybody else. He said, I want to make sure I hadn't run in vain. They couldn't add anything to me. Now, this is the amazing thing. The apostles' doctrine did not exist in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are Old Testament books. They're not New Testament books. Hebrews 9 says you can't have it. The Testament can't come into effect till after the death of the testator. Christ Jesus died at the end of those three books. They're not New Testament books. You can't find New Testament doctrine in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can find it in a shadow. But you tell me how to be born again. Well, 238. That wasn't in the four Gospels. They didn't have any way of understanding how to be born again until after the day, after the Holy Ghost poured out on the day of Pentecost. And we're going to drink living water. Nobody preached to me to drink living water. It says me to get the Holy Ghost. They told me later, well, that's living water. Well, okay. In fact, John had to explain what he was talking about when he said, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He would be told me as the scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But parentheses is in the King James, verse 39, but this take ye of the Spirit, which they that believe on him to the sea. Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. You would really want to mess with the Trinitarians? Look at that word given in verse 39 because it's in italics. And in the King James Version, words in italics are not there for emphasis. It's the integrity of the translators letting you know that they did not translate a word in the original text. They added it because they thought it was supposed to be there. And you don't leave that word in unless it doesn't change. If the verse means exactly the same thing without the italicized word as it does with the italicized word, then it's no big deal either. But if taking the italicized word out changes what the verse is saying. And so let's see, is there a difference between the Holy Ghost not being yet, not yet being given and the Holy Ghost not being not yet? Well, the Spirit of God's always existed. Not like that. How do I know that? Because the Spirit of God dwelling in me is the kingdom of God. Here we God not be great, but righteous peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Jesus said the kingdom of God's within you. Well, it wasn't when he said it, but it was going to be. Right? And yet Jesus said of John the Baptist, he was the greatest prophet born of woman. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. Wait, wait just a minute. John the Baptist is greater than David. I would call him a prophet. Moses, he was a prophet. Samuel, he was a prophet. Want to go on? And John the Baptist was the greatest prophet born of woman. And that a four-year-old child that gets baptized and receives the Holy Ghost is greater than John the Baptist. And I think that kind of draws a pretty fine line between the Old and New Testament, doesn't it? It does. So when he said, Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. What did he deliver? To 
delivered the faith. And you find that reference to the first, first part of Acts chapter 1, where he gave commandments to the apostles. What was the commandment? Commandment is teach them everything I've taught you and command them to do it like I've taught you. That was the faith being once delivered to the cross. And what is the faith? We are to do everything the apostles taught and practiced it because of where they got it from. They got it from Jesus. Everything. Well, I got a question for you. Anybody ever read the verse where Paul said, Quote of Jesus is saying, it's more blessed to give than receive. Everybody read that? You heard that verse? That's not in the Gospels. Paul quoted Jesus as saying, it's more blessed to give than receive. Find that verse in the Bible, in the four Gospels. First, find the words where it's recorded that way. Well, it, 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 it's not there. No, it's not. Except that John said in John 21, 25, closing out the gospel of God, there are many other things which Jesus did and said, but which is they should be written in one. I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. So if Paul quoted Jesus, the fact that's not in those four gospels, it had to have been somewhere because he quoted Jesus. Otherwise, the Bible's wrong. We got another problem. Matthew 6, Luke 11, he's teaching them how to pray. The prayers are not ver verbatim in Matthew 6 and Luke 11. In Matthew 6, he's teaching a, a mixed multitude on a mountainside. And uh, there were disciples in that group. There were people who were not disciples. And so he approached prayer very differently in Matthew 6. In Luke 11, he is speaking to a closed group, just his disciples. And they said, Lord, teach us to pray, even as John taught his disciples to pray. And he taught us those two prayers. And the Greek word that begins uh, in the first couple of verses, uh, words in, in both of those places. After this manner, pray ye, or pray ye after this. The word pray is in the imperative tense of command. What he taught in Matthew 6 and in Luke 11 was a commandment. And he commanded us, them, to teach us to, cut, to obey everything he commanded them. I got a question. Show me one verse after Acts 2, verse 4. Anywhere in the rest of Acts or in the epistles where anybody references anything that sounded like Matthew 6 or Luke 11. <laughs> well, there's, there's a problem with the Bible. There's not a problem at all. I've got to trust Jesus and the apostles. And the Lord left blanks on purpose to test our faith. Now, what is the what does that really mean? What it means is he never intended us for us to repeat those words pray and call it prayer. I can show you every principle he taught them to pray. In those two chapters or those two places, I can show you the principles of those things he taught, taught and practiced throughout the rest of the, the, the Bible, the rest of Acts and in the epistles. It's in there. But you don't, you don't 
realize it's in there if you're trying to compare verbiage with verbiage. But you compare principle with principle, and it's all in there. He told us to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered in the saints. My question to you is this. If the apostles obey Jesus and faithfully talk, in the book of Acts, in the epistles, what Jesus taught them, then do we not have a spiritual responsibility to go back and compare everything we're doing and thinking and saying to how they did it? And if we can't find it, then we're not in the faith. And Jude was concerned about that. Rather, he wasn't trying to send us all to hell. He was trying to say, hey, we need a course correction here. Because the, the chart, the only reliable chart is Acts, Romans through Jude, and then Revelation. That's the spiritual chart. And if, and if I'm not, if, if my course isn't being set by that chart, I'm not going to get to my destination. Not getting there. And of course, again, I realize, I understand what that means is it feels like I'm standing, sitting here, tracking everything we've said and done. I'm not doing that at all. Wouldn't it feel better for you to go to the Bible and find for yourself, okay, well, this is what I believe and do, and there is the book. The scripture says we are, we have a responsibility, a spiritual responsibility to be able to give an answer to every man concerning the what? The faith that is in us. We're so quick to send people to hell for doing this and not doing this. Well, I'll take something right now. That's a fearful thing. I remember I was 24, my wife was 19. We went to, we got a, we drove into the city of Annapolis, Maryland, the 12th of September, 1970. And we had nobody. And of course, as you all know, our state is named Mary Land. Not M E R R Y. M A R Y. The original capital city of the colony of Maryland was St. Mary City. I give you a hint. That was the only land grant for a colony given by England to those of the Catholic faith. So that, that Catholic spirit is everywhere, but it's really there. It's there. And I said, the Lord, you, you sent me here. How am I going to reach these people? He said, you tell them not to believe anything that anyone can't show them in the Bible, including you. And that's what I said. You know, here's Acts 2.38. Just read it. This is what it says. Um, you can see this for yourself. You can read this for yourself. You can do exactly what this says. Here it is. You can do it. And here's examples of people doing it. Here it is. Well, you know, they went to their priests. And ask the question. 
And the preacher said, this was his answer. His name was Father Bouquet. He said, well, the church you're talking about, they put a whole lot more emphasis. This is, he's, his, these are his exact words. They put a whole lot more emphasis on the Bible than we do. We get most of our teachings out of the writings of the Apostolic Fathers. That's the hip third, fourth century. After all, the apostles were dead. I can't tell you how much I appreciate those who went through the turmoil and the storms of leaving their churches, receiving the Holy Ghost and being so negatively dealt with in the 19 zeros to 10, the teens and whatever. I mean, they were, <laughs> I appreciate that. Don't forget the Holy Ghost poured out initially what we that we dated in Topeka, Kansas, in 1900. Correct? They didn't even get a revelation of baptism of Jesus until 1914. 14 years, a long time. It may not seem like it's a long time, but it's, four, it's, <laughs> it's a long time. Right? What about all those people who got the Holy Ghost didn't get baptized? The revelation of one God was the result of the revelation of baptism in Jesus' name. Why? The reason they hold on to Matthew 28, 19 and don't want to add verse 20 to the rest of the sentence as the rest of the sentence is because if you do a search and you're online concordance or on your phone or whatever and put these four words in to search father son holy ghost you'll find there's exactly one verse in the entire bible with all four of those words in it matthew 28 19 it's not about baptism it's about trinitarian doctrine they can't accept your reasoning and your discussion of baptism in Jesus' name because it takes away their only verse that says what they say is the Godhead. But of course, verse 20, as the second half of that sentence, automatically requires you to see how the apostles did baptism and how they did baptism. It was their contemporary, contemporary interpretation of Jesus' words in Matthew 28, 19. But of course, what? how many times have you heard this? I'd rather take the words of Jesus than the words of the apostles. See, so we've got John working back to front, John, Gospel of John, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Mark, and the Gospel of Jesus. Oh, that's right. It's the Gospel of Matthew. So you got to take the words of an apostle to know the words of Jesus. And, and, and that's so simple, isn't it? Yes, it is simple, unless you're blind. And why are we blind? Because we'd like to defend our tradition. I think, mean, oh my. I want you to ask yourself this question. Be careful how you answer. Do I believe that a person has to be water baptized in Jesus' name and receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the initial evidence of speaking other tongues to be saved? Don't answer me. You are the one to answer that. Because here's the problem. If I believe that, that compels me to change a lot of stuff.
<laughs> we flew in this morning, and you know, of course, we were in the airport with people in Baltimore, and we were in the airport with people in Boston, and then we were in for an hour, we were in the Carnival Center, Boston, and people everywhere. And I just don't know how in the world we're going to get the gospel then, because the gospel is these are our service times, and you must come to our church so that you can hear that Jesus died for you, rose again, and sent to heaven. Because the only way we're really focused on getting you the gospel is if you come to church. I got a question. What chance does the great, great majority of those people have? Yeah. I have another question. Calculate the seating capacity of every church in the Mass Rhode Island district of the UPCI, and then compare that to the population of Mass Rhode Island and tell me how much chance those folks have to be saved if the way to get saved is to come to church to hear the gospel. Why is that still our number one focus? Because that's what we're coming with. Because if we don't believe that's the number one focus, then we've got to go search the scriptures to find out what our number one focus is. What are we supposed to be doing? Another question for me. Somebody give me a book chapter of the verse where you and I are commanded to save people. that we are not obedient to Jesus unless we go out there with this group and they get saved. Now, when I make preaching the gospel to people a task, a required task, that is not valid unless somebody gets saved. I just made it a work. But that means, here's the problem. We all believe that the sower in the parable of the sower was Jesus. He's pretty much a failure. How reckless is him to so see a wayside ground? He didn't know the birds they were going to eat them. How reckless is he? To sow that seed on stony ground. Didn't he know the stones were going to keep that root from getting any kind of death? How reckless was he to sow seed on ground that hadn't been properly plowed? Therefore, the weeds were going to choke it out forever for fruit. Unless the success is just the fact the seed got sown, rest is up to the ground. When my success to failure is based on my results, I just became God because only God gets the increase. My success to failure is whether or not I've got the gospel out to every preacher. Why well, do that? Ecclesiastes says, give a little seven on so the eight. You don't know what's going to work today. That means there's all kinds of different ways I could get the gospel seed to somebody. Now it's up to that ground what they do with it. That's why the Baptists had such a problem with he that believeth in this baptized shall be saved, he that believeth not shall be damned. See there, you're not damned if you don't get baptized. Right, because if you believe, you're going to get baptized. 
If you don't believe, you're not going to be baptized. And there's no way to believe you and not be baptized. The previous part of that verse says that. So not everybody who preach the gospel to is going to get baptized. Only those that believe. And their faith is between them and God. Not between me and them. The Greek word talks about convincing somebody that a person who believes is convinced. Here's the problem. There's no place in the Bible the Lord requires me to convince them. He doesn't require me to debate them and win the debate. I'm a debater. I love debating. I have won so many debates that I didn't win people. The Lord finally said to me, I didn't call you to win the base of these people. I told you to just tell them the gospel. What they do with it is between me and them. But is that our focus? It's not our focus. What's our focus? Just before I say this, I want you to know that I am currently a member in good standing as an honorary member of the General Board of the United Pentecostal Church. I am currently a member in good standing as an honorary president of the Maryland D.C. District Board. Now, how long that'll last, I don't know. It's not going to be up to me if it, if it changes because I've got to say what God gives me to say. The bottom line is this. We're not called to grow churches. We're not called to grow crowds. We're called to preach the gospel to every preacher. That's in the book. You know the beauty of sowing seed? You can hand a four-year-old a bag of seed and say, do this. And they can go, it may not, may not be pretty, but is it better for it to be pretty or for the seed to get sown? This is called earnestly contending for the faith. And if you do a study of the Greek word translated by the words earnestly contend, you'll see that I'm doing a very mild job of what the Greek word says. It's a very strong word. <laughs> very strong. Word. And then, of course, <laughs> We're commanded to be witnesses. And the Greek word there, the English equivalent letters are, is M-A-R-T-Y-R, -R, which of course is the English word martyr. So to be a witness means I don't tell people that I say to tell it. I tell everybody regardless of what they do. And the adversary is doing his best doing his best to intimidate the church into keeping their mouth shut because there are no more discussions. If you say anything that is contrary to the current agenda, you are automatically vilified. Well, why is that? You say, well, you know, the early church had it easy. Really? Yeah. We want to, I want, I want you to, uh, I want you to hear the gospel of Jesus. But you do understand that if you believe in Jesus, get baptized, get the Holy Ghost, that you could be put to death for that. So right now it's just words, right? We, we're not really yet. We will be, but not yet. We're not in danger of being put in jail for it. Yet. Well, the book says you can't run with a footman. How are you going to run with a horse? Truck? Right. So if we can't witness to people just because we would risk having somebody yell at us, 
calleth names. How are we going to do it when we're actually, our lives are in line? First, we contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before ordained under this condemnation. There are people who have been baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, who are making choices to live outside the specifics of the word. And because they're making those choices, the Lord is giving them over to Satan to use them to spread false doctrine in the church as a test. Paul said, heresies must come. They reveal our hearts. This will be the one spot of the gun. Some of you have been in this district long enough to know, know the names of people that were one God apostolics. We're not preaching the truth. I went to, I lived in Rhode Island, my ninth and tenth grade years of high school, and went to church uh, in Cranston, Rhode Island. And the pastor of that church uh, was the district superintendent of New England, everything except Connecticut. And uh, he left the truth, became Trinitarian. He's not the only one. I don't remember the name of the city, it's just across the border in Vermont. What's the biggest city when you're right across the border in Vermont? Sorry, I didn't think I heard it, so I didn't understand it. Anyway, no, it's a, um, but, uh, not that this is this big a deal. I don't know why I'm making a big deal of it. But, uh, Brattleboro. I went to church there in Brattleboro when, in high school. We went up there. It's a big, big church. That man went years back. The biggest church in Connecticut. Guy was superintendent of Connecticut. He went years back. You know what? First four that Jesus was warning against was those guys. Because they didn't just leave on their own, they took people with them. And why did that happen? There were people that knew what these guys, which direction these guys were going. Who stood up and protested this? <laughs> the guy that was my pastor, he was district superintendent of what was central New England because Vermont and New Hampshire was still with him. When he turned in his card and avowed that he was Trinitarian. He went from being district superintendent of the district to being a Trinitarian. Who called him out on that? He said, well, how do you know that? Because he told me right across his own table when I was 22 years old. He said, he superintendent at that time. And he stayed superintendent for several years. He said, I don't know where you people get this one box stuff. When I look in the Bible, I see three. The district superintendent, the Central New England District, the United Pentecostal Church, said that to me across his table in Cranston, Rhode Island in 1968. Well,
At 76, I got nothing to lose. And I got a big mouth. And if people don't like this, take it up with him because it's in the book. In the next three sessions, from my part of this, we're going to be going through some detail comparing this. What does it mean to be apostolic? What, in the scripture, specifically, what is it that divides traditional Pentecostals from apostolic? What was the difference biblically, scripturally? What is the difference? That's what we're going to look at in detail. Okay? I'm really happy to have my youngest son here. He's not young. <laughs> but, <laughs> no offense. But uh, the Lord has given him some things in, con in the context of what I'm talking about what the Lord's talking about. And I've asked him to come with me and he's going to be sharing in each one of these sessions for a while uh, some specific application of the principles of the teachings of the apostles. Um, I believe it will help you. Praise God. I got to leave this here on so you can use that. Joel says, right. Praise God. Let's just do this for a moment. If you just take a moment and close your eyes and lift your hands to the Lord. Let's just take a moment. I know for a lot of you that have been a part of meetings with Bishop in the past, this is different, and it is different. It's going to be different. But we cannot eliminate the, uh, the need for the Spirit of God to make manifest in us. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Holy Ghost. We need the Holy Ghost to seal these words in us. You're not going to get all this intellectually. You're going to have to receive it in your spirit. It's not something you're going to understand in your mind. You're going to figure it all out. If you try to do that, it's going to lead to confusion and frustration and you're just going to end up questioning all of it, and dismissing it all. But if you would listen with the, with the ears of the spirit, to hear what the spirit is saying, God will begin to bring revelation. Praise God. Praise God. Bishop said he was 76 and that he didn't care. And obviously we understand the context of what he meant by that. And I guess I'm, I'm, I'm only 41, but I am my father's son. So I don't know where that leaves me. Somewhere <laughs> close behind. I don't know if I'm quite to the 76 year old part of not caring, but I think the, uh, the, the mantle of not caring is dragging close behind. I, uh, this would have been 2020, towards the uh, end of 2020, beginning of 2021. I don't want to go through all the details of the story, how it happened. It's, it's not really relevant to how it happened. But the Lord told me to one day to call. This was, I, I had no, no, no connection, no, nothing to gain by it. It was a non-UPCI connection that had gotten a hold of me, was asking me some questions, and they said, "Would you, would you call this particular place and talk to these particular people?" Because I think there's some common ground there. And I said, sure, I'll pray about it. So I was praying and seeking the Lord if I would, was to do this. And so I felt love, love of the Lord. So I called a Southern Baptist church in 
in the state of Texas, they run somewhere around four or 5,000. I had no idea. And you know, I just looked up the number on Google, call, call the number in, and um, it came to a generic voicemail. Uh, and so I left a generic message and said, I don't really know who I'm trying to reach, but uh, I'd like to speak to someone um, regarding uh, certain, your, your, uh, your small group ministry. And um, I have to be honest with you, I did not expect any return call. But because it was the Lord telling me to do it, the next day I get a call back from the guy I was trying to reach. And he was on vacation. And he said, um, this is so-and-so, and I'm giving you a call back. I reached out and said, I'm actually on vacation, but I just felt I should call you. And he said, I can't talk, but I just want to let you know I got your message when I get back. Uh, I'll call you. I said, okay. And again, I would give a little faith, did not expect to hear from him. Week passed. I think it was about two weeks between the time he called. I get a call. Pick it up. Hello. This is so-and-so. He was back in the office. So we got to talking and um, to sharing with him some of the principles that the bishop's sharing with you and sharing with the next couple of days. And um, he said, the Southern Baptists have a seven million uh, person problem. 1996, they did, a, they did a study in 2018. They went back into their records in 1996. According to their records in 1996, across all of Southern Baptist Convention, they were running, their Sunday morning total was, and this was their verified total of what was actually in attendance, not their membership roles. They readily admitted that their membership roles far exceeded their actual attendance. So they were just wanting to know how many actual people are coming into our Sunday morning services. So they did some digging and went back to the records and I don't know how they do it, how, how they to keep track, but apparently they had a pretty good record. And they came up with, they were running 5.224 million Sunday morning attendees in 1996. Over the next 20 years from 1996, this is, and I'll tell you the punchline to how he knew all this data. In 1996 to 2016, they had record of 7.1 million baptisms across the Southern Baptist movement. 7.1. So at 5.224 Sunday morning attendance and with a 7.1 million addition of people that for them, to their theology, was making a commitment. Their expectation was that the data, when they looked at the data 20 years later, across that period of time, their expectation was that the attendance should somewhat match the addition. And he said to me, we were, this is not just a local assembly, this was, this was the largest Christian denomination outside of Catholicism in our country. And when they found the data, they were alarmed because what they found is from 1996 to 2016, they went from 5.224 million to 5.2 million. They actually went down 24,000 in 20 years, even though they had 7.1 million baptisms. And he said to me, between the time he called me on vacation and by the time he called me back two weeks later, he had just been hired by the Southern Baptist Convention. He was, I forgot where their headquarters were, somewhere in Texas, I believe it is. He had just been hired by the Southern Baptist Convention to uh, come to their headquarters to help revamp their church structures because they had relied so much on Sunday morning as the matrix that they realized it was no longer working and they needed another way because they weren't keeping the people they were baptizing. 
this was not somebody that was just this not somebody. This is like I literally, I got his number in my phone. In fact, he, I told him some of the things I'll be telling you in the last couple of days, and just sharing with you, sharing with him some stuff. And he goes, you know, would you would you be willing to pray for me that God would give me direction? And I, I understand. I understand the theological implications of all this. Please, I'm not suggesting, but just because here's why I say this. All that Bishop said, and I know he was kind of touching on a lot of different things, but but this is not about a theological problem. We don't have an issue with our theology, but the problem is we have an issue with our churchology. And for us, our churchology is equal to our theology. And it's our churchology that's actually destroying our theology. But because we think we have the correct theology, we don't really ever question our churchology. But because the devil knows he can't defeat true theology, the only way he can true, defeat true theology is by messing with churchology. And so he laid the trap. I mean, about 1800 years ago to steal churchology from the original church because he knew he could never stop theology. But churchology became so powerful that it put true theology in the dark for 1,700 years, 1,800 years. And so now here we are in 2022, and I am thankful for the revelation of theology that we have been given, beginning as Bishop talked about back in the 1900s that's been passed down. But I believe here we are in 2022, and God has given the church in America and across the world as we have stepped into that theology. But now the same impact that theology had in the 19th century, if we could get the revelation of true churchology, it's going to have a greater impact because it's finally going to set free theology to be what it was in the early church, because in the early church, theology and churchology matched up but we have now taken theology and wrapped it into old churchology and so now if you look at statistics and i'm not getting anybody we can high five yes awesome i can go to every meeting and tell we are having revival we're having revival we're having revival but let's be frank folks look at the statistics we are not making a dent i'm not 76 years old so i guess I'm not quite there, and I like that chair idea. I'm kind of like, I'm, just, I'm not physically able to, to just feel, but I like this idea. I did receive the Holy Ghost where they were sitting. So. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not, we're not, we're not statistically, we're not making it in. I, and I'm not knocking anything. I, I, for several years, the Lord opened up a door for me to minister in some churches in Southern California and in Southern California, in that district, I believe that their population in that district was like 30 million people. And, and I believe, if I'm correct on this, Michael told me one day, Bishop, remember, I don't know how many churches they had, something. Oh, um, yeah, I want to say 100, 115. And, and if you listen to the rhetoric, and I'm not knocking the rhetoric, but if you listen, we are reaching Southern California. Really? Really? I'm not knocking anyone here for the efforts. I'm in a metropolitan area myself. I'm not knocking anybody, but we're not reaching this area. We're, we've got plant, we've planted churches here. Great. But are we really, truly reaching it? And so if that's the case, the problem is we've had people that start to look at the effect or the lack of effect we're having, and they start going to look for answers. And the first place to look at it, it must be a theological problem. And so what happens? Well, if we start changing theology, because, you know, obviously our theology is just too divisive, because look at all these churches out there that are having great results with a different theology. And then you go to the source of the biggest success story in our country, the SBC, and they're telling you, listen, something's messed up. It's not a theological problem. It's not our theolo the theology is too divisive. It's a churchology problem. So in the next couple of days, I believe in the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is challenging those. And I don't, like Bishop said, the, the, 
the, the calling is to do the will of God, not to take attendance and not to question who's here, who's not here. And, and I only know a couple of you in here, so that actually makes it better. I'm not here to know who's here. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't even know in this room who's a pastor and who's not. So it's great. Because I can just say what the Lord tells me to say. I'm not worried about the implications, but I was, we, we ate, we ate lunch, or early dinner, late lunch with Pastor Todd at um, 99, literally right up the street. And uh, towards the end of the meal, I went up to use the restroom and I was walking to the restroom. And when I was walking to the restroom, the Lord spoke this to me. And I don't know who else is coming. So it might be for the rest that are coming, if there are more coming, or it just could be for those of you in this room. But the Holy Ghost spoke to me. He said, for the next two days, there's going to be three categories of people in this room. There are some of you that as the word is being spoken, it's going to bring confirmation. For some of you, it's going to bring revelation. But then there's a group of you that is going to bring elimination. We can sit here today and debate the merits of COVID and all that we went through in 2020. And I'm sure everyone has their varying opinions on all of that. But the last time I checked, no government, no governor, no president has the authority to shut down the church. If you, if you posted this, or I, I'm not on social media, so I don't know if you did this or not. And if you had a sandwich board and you were walking around with a megaphone and you did this, I don't know if you did this or not. But this whole thing that we were so up in arms that the, how can we shut down the church? The church is essential. Prove right there that our churchology is wrong. How can you shut down something that man has no power over? Yes, I, I'll tell the story later on as we get into this. I, from tw March of 2020 until Easter of this Easter several months ago, and I did not stutter when I said that, from March 2020 to Easter of several months ago, the church I pastored did not have an in-person church service because of COVID. We went two years and two months with no church service. Now, the punchline to that, which I'll share with you later, is not only did we go through that period of two years and two months with no church service, but we came out stronger, more powerful. I can tell you all that stuff later as God leads me to share that. So that's not a, a doomsday story. The point I'm making is, is that I believe, and this is my own personal belief, and so you may see something different. So I, I'm not saying this is the way it, it's got to be or it was. This is what the way I see it. So if man does not have the authority to shut down the church, but God allowed churches to be shut down for periods of time, and it was varying degrees of that. I know for us from the, from the Northeast, we had a very different experience than those in the South. I have friends of mine from the Southern states and I don't even know what country they, they, for them and never even, it was a, it wasn't even a, a, a barely a moment stoppage, but for a lot of us, we dealt with a lot of different obstacles for, for months and months and months based off our, uh, our governor and how they think in these areas. But all that being said, I, I personally believe God allowed all that. Why? Because I, I believe that, first of all, God is sovereign. He cannot lie. And his word, as Bishop has taught for years, and you go on, on, on Apostolic Iron, the Bible with the Bishop, and you can hear all the teaching, and I'm not even going to try to even, even touch the depth he goes to, but God promised that in the last days he would pour out his spirit. That's not a trickle. I don't believe that what we're going to see in the last days is just a gathering of a handful of people and that's it. So somewhere along the line, and I don't believe that there's just going to be a magic church service we come to where, voila, there it is. 
I believe that God's revelation always leads to revival. Look at the revelation and look what, what comes after that. And so I believe God is beginning to move throughout and whatever small portion I play in that. And I mean that with, with, with as, as much humility as I can say. I'm not suggesting that this is the only group out there, but I, whatever, whatever's happening in, in, the, in the kingdom of God and whatever small part, I believe that God has brought a line of division. And the line of division is not theology. Bishop, if I say anything in the Holy Ghost, you're here. I'm, I'm submitting all this to you because some of this stuff, I'm listening to myself say it and going, oh, Lord Jesus. I should be 76. <laughs> but the line that's going to God is drawing is not a line of theology. The theological line was drawn in the 1800s and the early part of the last hundred years. That's where the theological line was drawn. But there is a churchology line being drawn. And just like the theological line drew in the early 1900s that divided that portion, there's a churchology line being drawn that's going to divide in a greater way the remnant that God is trying to separate that's going to go back to this book and going to go no matter what the cost is, we're going to go back to the very fundamental because we say that. We're going to go back to the way the apostles baptized, back to the way the apostles believed. Back to the original, when they received the Holy Ghost from the day of Pentecost. If we're going to do that, then we need to go all the way back to the same day of Pentecost because Peter not only gave a theological foundation, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for forgiveness you sins, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But if you keep reading a little further down, and we'll get to it later in this session, he gave a churchology foundation as well. So theological came in 38 and churchology was laid in 42. But we love 38, but 42 is kind of, you know, it's got to take or leave it, you know. 38, we got to have. 42. And I would suggest how many people in our churches can quote 38, but they don't even know 42 is in the Bible. We have 38 plastered all over the walls on our websites. If we were allowed to, we'd have it tattooed on our arms. Because 38 is the verse. But Peter gave 38, but he didn't stop with 38 because he gave not only the theological foundation of the New Testament church, but he continued to give the churchology foundation of the New Testament church. But here we are today, and so last century, God brought the church back to the revelation of 38, but I believe in this century, God is trying to bring the church back to the revelation of 42. And when you get 38 and 42 together, then you get the end of chapter 2 that says, and he added to the church daily. These are the men that turned the world upside down. How they do that? It wasn't just 38. It was 38 and 42 coming together. But here's the problem. Some of you are going to say, this is confirmation to what God's already showed me. I thought I was the only one that believed some of this stuff. And you're going to walk out of here going, man, I'm not, I'm not crazy after all. God, you are showing me this. And some of you, the light bulb's going to come off. and You're going to go, wow, see the revelation. But some of you, there's going to be elimination. Because watch, let's go back real quick. And I'm not going to be very long. This is all the Lord told me to do this morning. Tonight, and we're going to have more in the next four sessions. But let's go back to when Jesus stepped on the scene. Three things happened when he stepped on the scene. There was confirmation, revelation, and elimination. Because why? To John the Baptist, it was confirmation. He said, there's coming one that I can't even touch what he can do. I I'm not even going to be able to buckle his shoes. He's going to baptize you with fire. And when he stepped on the scene, he goes, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. To John, when Jesus stepped on the scene, it wasn't revelation. It was confirmation to what he already knew. In fact, it was already in the womb. So it was confirmation. But then later on, we find when Jesus asked him, who do you say I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he says, you got it. How do you say it? 
Revelation. So for John, it was confirmation. For Peter, it was revelation. But then there was a whole nother group that he came to. But because they could not get their churchology out of the way, their theolo theology matched up with the Messiah. Their theology believed in the promises of the Messiah, but their churchology kept them from seeing the revelation when he was standing right in front of them. And because of that, they were eliminated. The group we always point the finger at, which they were part of it. I'm not here to defend them. But the group we always point the finger at is the Pharisees. Because someone starts acting up in our church, we say, well, that's the Phariseeical attitude. But let's, let's, let's just, you know, we have, we have such a, 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 a I'm going to say this kindly, and I'm not going to be able to say it kindly. So understand, I'm trying to say it kindly, but I don't know how to say it kindly. So it's going to come out like I'm not being kind, but I'm trying to be kind. We have a little bit of an arrogance when we look at the word of God because we're looking backwards. And when we look backwards, we have a tendency to go, I would never have been like that. I, could have never, I, would, I would have been, I would have, no, I, I would have been right there at the cross, catching blood, because I was so in love with Jesus. I would have never been Peter. Really? Really? You, you have a lot more faith in yourself. I don't know if I would have been one of those. Because I'm looking back. I know the end of the story. They didn't. It's easy. To, it's easy. You know? If you, if, you, if you watch a game that's been recorded, you already know the score. If your team's down by 100 runs, you don't care. Because you know the end of the game. Now, if you're watching that game live and your team's down, and I know I'm in New England country, and there's been times where before your Messiah left to go south, <laughs> that you were down. And Pharaoh looked like he was keeping the children in bondage. But in the fourth quarter of the Super Bowl, you know what? I remember watching that particular game live and Seeing, my goodness, I, I don't think they have a, have a hope of coming back to the Falcons. So there's no hope. And every play, you didn't know what was going to happen. But you know what? You go watch that game now. How much stress do you have? How much anxiety do you have? You know, man, it's, it's 28 to 3. Doesn't matter. They're going to win. It's easy to watch something and judge something when you're looking back versus when you're looking forward. So we look back at scripture. We go, I'd have never been, I, I, I would have, I would have been right there. I would have seen him. I would have known him. But here's the problem. The Pharisees, for what they, problem they caused, if you peel back the layer, they actually had some decent intent. Because you see, when they returned from, the children of Israel returned from, from exile, and there was a desire for the restoring of the kingdom, three groups arose. You had those that believe when Messiah comes. When Messiah comes. This was the group that really the disciples, a lot of disciples figured out, because when Messiah came, he's going to do this, and he's going to leave. This is, he, this, is, this is Messiah. That's the sign. So when Jesus comes, what would they argue? Well, when you came, can I sit on this thing? Can I be this? Can I be the, you know, the treasurer? Can I be the the secretary of defense, they're arguing that because that was their mentality. Then you had a whole other group that, that believed that when, 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 when to restore the kingdom, we restore it by force. This is where we get some things like the Maccabean revolt that took place. And then when Jesus would have been a small child, the Romans executed 2,000 revolutionaries, crucified them along the road leading in and out of Jerusalem. Can you imagine that? Jesus would have been a child, would have seen that. It would have been right about the time he came back from Egypt. And it was right about that time in Roman history that there was a, a revolt in Judea. And the Romans did not mess around, did not just simply put down. They lined all 2,000 of them jokers up and crucified them along the road and left them there as a sign. Don't mess with us. But there was a third group that said, look, we've messed up because we've disobeyed God. And you know what? He punched us. He sent us an exile. We lost it. 
So he loves it. If we do everything right, we get all our eyes dotted and every T crossed. We can live, not only live the standard, but let's go above. I mean, let's do it more. If we can do all that, then the kingdom will be restored. For the Pharisees, it wasn't just about coming down. It was about restoring the kingdom. Because if we can follow all these things and do it right, then we're obligating God to restore the kingdom because we messed up the first time and we disobeyed. And here's what happened. So if we can obey to the highest degree, it's obligating. So when Jesus shows up, he starts messing with their churchology because he was saying your performance is not going to bring the kingdom. Your living perfectly is not going to get the kingdom revealed. The kingdom is going to come revealed through me. They started, they started pushing back because they did not. It wasn't necessarily their issue with his theology, even though there's some problems there they had. But they were messing with the churchology that they had tried to establish. Because when the, when the book of Acts happened and the whole thing took place and the gospel began to spread, they called their little henchmen and said, listen, Mr. Paul, we got to put this down because they're messing everything up. Not only are they messing up our relationship with the Romans who kind of let us be, but here's the bigger problem. They're messing up our doctrine because they're messing up the way we've done things. And this is going to all go south. But see, I would have never been a Pharisee. I would have never been that. Really? Because you start talking about theology, amen. You start talking about churchology, woo, don't mess with my churchology. Because I believe this is how Messiah is going to come. I believe this is how we're going to reach the world is this way. And then when you start showing the biblical way, because Messiah did not come with a, with a, with a white horse, he came as a baby, even though it had been prophesied, it didn't matter to them because their churchology had already convinced them it was going to be a different way. Even though Isaiah already said it's going to happen this way, didn't see anymore because their churchology had blinded them to that. But see, today we think somehow, what would happen that way? But then we stand one of the pivotal moments of history. The dividing line of history, not just biblical history, the dividing line of, of, of all history. It's the birth of Christ. History is divided between those two, B.C. and A.D., based off the birth of Christ. And the defining moment of Christ's life is the cross. And the defining moment of the cross is Jesus is held prisoner. The Lord gave me this several years ago, and I've shared it now as the Lord led. Because this is such a defining moment, not only in the scriptural text, but also it's such a defining moment. In this, where we are right now, I believe as a church, and I believe it's a defining moment for us in this room. Some of you have already made this, made this decision, but some of you need to hear because you need to understand what's at stake here. Jesus is held prisoner, and as a custom of the time, there was going to be a prisoner released. This was a custom that the, the Jews had 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 negotiated with the Romans that this would take place at this particular time. And so this was the custom. And so when Pilate asks, who do you want? We know it, right? We, we, we know it. We know the response of the crowd. Give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. That would have been, you know, and we sit there and we go, oh, I mean, if, if I was there that day, I know I would have been different because the crowd would have been going, Barabbas, Barabbas. But I would have been going, Jesus, Jesus, because I would have never, because I would have never given up on Jesus for Barabbas. But here's the problem. It's unique. We know Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptic gospels. Synoptic because it is believed that they have the similarities of them and the source material used in, in the, 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 the writing of them give a similarity to their 
the story of Acadius. But then John comes along. And John's gospel is so different. John begins with this beautiful opening statement of power and might. In the beginning was the word, the words with God, the word was God. Then John 2 gives us the story of Jesus turning the water into wine. And John 3 gives us this guy named Nicodemus. And John 4 gives us the woman at the well. And John 8 tells us about the forgiving of the woman through the adultery. And then later on, John tells us about Lazarus. So John is telling us all these things that's not in the first three gospels. But what's unique is there are certain aspects of scripture that is repeated in all four gospels. The birth of Jesus is not even given in all four gospels. John just goes straight into the story and Mark just skips straight into it. Only Matthew and Luke give us the birth. Now, we know the death of Christ is in all four gospels. But one of the few things that was in all four gospels is this, this moment. And what's unique is, look how many pivotal characters in the Gospels. We don't even know their name. The woman with the issue of blood. The woman at the well. How many faceless and nameless people did Jesus heal? And what's unique, not only is this story repeated in all four Gospels, but not only is it given to us, but his name is given to us by all four Gospel writers. The Bible says, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a word be established. We have four witnesses giving not only the story, but the name behind the story. That's significant, something significant there. But when you read it just in the context of it, it doesn't seem more than just, it seems, it seems to be just simply a, a, a blunder of decision. It just seems to be one, one of, the, one of, one of the, the greatest, absolute, unexplainable moments of, of history. And how could they do this? This is the one who had, who had, had raised from the dead and who had, who had healed the, 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 the lame and had opened deaf ears and, and opened blind eyes. And they're, they're, they're literally standing there calling out, forgive us, Barabbas. But when you look at the context of all four gospel writers, each one of them gives us a little bit of a different spin on what he was. And we know Barabbas was a revolutionary. He had led a revolt. In fact, in that revolt, he had committed murder. Based on the fact that he was in a Roman prison and he was in a revolt and it was a murderer, you can sort of begin to put together with, in context with Roman law that the murdering was actually of either a Roman citizen or more than likely a Roman soldier. He wasn't a, a reject. He was a hero. Barabbas wasn't some guy sitting in a cell and you're going, you know, I'm going to be executed. They're calling your name. Who, me? Who, me? Oh, I guess I'll just see what happens. No. Man, Barabbas was a name spoken in praise everywhere on the streets of Jerusalem. Because here's somebody who did something about this Roman oppression. This guy's a hero. He wasn't some low-level reject prisoner hanging out that we said, well, let's just get, we'll give you Jesus. You give us this guy, then, you know, just this Barabbas guy, because we, we'll pick somebody. You know, it wasn't a multiple choice question. The crowd knew exactly that day who they wanted, because this guy was a hero. This guy was somebody they all wanted to be like, and they all wanted on their team. Kids were running through the streets of Jerusalem with wooden swords going, I'm Barabbas! Looking at the Roman soldiers going, but here's the powerful part of that entire thing. Barabbas is not really a name. Because when you break the name Barabbas down in the Hebrew, the name Barabbas is Bar, B-A-R, which is we get Bar Mitzvah. Bar is son. Bar Mitzvah, son of the commandment. So his name is son of the father. He's literally son of the father. Wait a minute. We had two choices. We got Barabbas, son of the father. And then we have this other guy from the hills of Nazareth who says that he's the son of the father. One guy's speaking revolution. The other guy's saying, if he asks you to carry back one, why don't you carry two? The kingdom 
is righteousness, peace, and joy. Not swords, guns, and knives. You know what, ultimately, this decision that day was not about Jesus or this little one that is. It was a decision on which way you want the kingdom. Do we want it? the son of the father, or of us, do we want it that way? Or do we want it through the son of the father, the living God, the Christ? <coughs> They chose that day to go to their own ability, their own power, their own power. They rejected the message that go to Jerusalem and carry. This was, this was what, what, what he was speaking of. He read it already. John chapter 7 hadn't been given yet, but it's coming. There's something coming. A king does not meet and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy. It's something coming here, guys. It's something coming. There's something happening here. But they rejected that. Both groups had the same basis of theology. But there was a split and elimination based off their idea. And for lack of a better term, we're going to call it. Their churchology. One wanted it this way, the other wanted it that way. And so, like God always does, He gives you a choice. Barabbas or Jesus. I believe today in the Holy Ghost. I submit this to Bishop. For whatever part I play, I believe God is asking every church leader. Every church member, not a theological question, even though I believe what Bishop said, that we need to go back and ask ourselves, do we really believe what we believe? But he's really asking us a deeper question. The next two days are not going to be about theolo theology. And I know for a lot of you that it's been exposed to pause, call the war, manifest, eat all those from the past. It's already very different. So if you're expecting that kind of meaning, probably not going to be the same kind of meaning. But the impact of what God is trying to do here will be for far greater, not to diminish the impact of those meanings, because this is about the positioning of the last day church. That God is looking for those who are going to carry out his apostolic mission. The question comes down to is simply, he gives you a choice. Jesus or Barabbas. Before you jump on your high horse and say, I would always choose Jesus over Barabbas. The choice is not about the individual. The choice is about the method. They didn't choose Jesus over Barabbas because they wanted one guy over another. I like Barabbas and his better. It was, I like his method over his method. This is not an argument or a, or a discussion over whose personality. It's a discussion and a line over methodology. And I believe in the Holy Ghost for what God has shown me. And I want to be on the right side of that line. I believe in the Holy Ghost. God is bringing a line. Began with COVID. God is bringing a line into into those who consider themselves a part of his church. Notice all those in that crowd that they were, that crowd were Jews. They were a part of his chosen people. These were not Moabites and Amalekites. These were Jews. This line that's coming is not about the Pentecostals and the one God versus the Trinitarians. This is not about the, 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 the apostolics and the Baptists. No, 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 no. This is about those who believe and profess they are in the kingdom of God as given to us by John chapter 3. Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot get into the kingdom of God. It's that group that God's saying, okay, now we're going to draw a line. Because we've always thought the line was theological, and it was, but now the theological line is being removed because the method is now. And I'm telling this in the Holy Ghost. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you. 
There are some out there, and God's given a chance. He's given a chance. And I'm, I'm way off right now. I'm, I need to tighten my mooring ropes to the, to the uh, a dock of authority over here and make sure my ship doesn't go sailing off in the blue. But I'm telling you, it's the Holy Ghost. We feel like because we have the theology correct, we can hold God hostage that he's going to have to use us because we have the right theology. But God's so desperate that there are some out there that have the wrong theology, but the right methodology, that he's going to bring revelation to them to bring them up in theology because they've already, they've already got the methodology. Now, before he does that, like he did with Israel, before he turned to the Gentiles, he gave him a chance. He was fair. God's fair. He's just. He's right. He, he doesn't just make decisions. He's given a chance. But when that chance is done, God is going to find somebody. He's that desperate because that's how strong he has placed in methodology. He's going to go find those whose methods are correct, but their theology is wrong. He's going to give them revelation. Because there's some out there right now that are starting to go, okay, wait a minute. They haven't gotten the revelation of the theology, but they're starting to get the revelation of methodology and go, this ain't working. This ain't working. We got to find something that works. And we got to go back to the original. That's what that, that Southern Baptist guy, he's like, we, we, we don't, we, this is not working. We've lost 7 million people in 20 years. It's not working. So we're now seeking. I've been brought here to seek it. Ask God. we got to go back to the original, find out where we went wrong. If they're doing that about their methodology, it's only a matter of time before they start going back and go, wait a minute. We got methodology. Now that's okay. But we, maybe there's something else there. And God's going to go, okay, you got methodology. Let's go theology. Because before we're arrogant about, well, they got methodology, but they don't have the theology. Well, we've got theology, but we don't have methodology. So who's right? Ooh, I better stop before I get myself in trouble. I don't even know who's on Zoom. Oh, Jesus. That's what this is about. God has chosen you to be here. He's divinely ordered it for you to be here. Because he wants to give you an opportunity to choose which side of the line you're going to be on. And from there, he's going to begin to take those. And I and, and the second part of that word God gave me was 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 confirmation, revelation, and elimination. But to those who he's going to give confirmation and revelation to, he's going to bring his acceleration. So for the group that is going to be confirmation and revelation, you're going to be given acceleration. And I'm almost done, but years ago, I was staying, I, we were going back and forth to Singapore beginning in 2008 to about 2012. We made like six or eight trips back and forth to Singapore. And this was, I think, 2010, 2011, somewhere in that. I'm standing in the hotel and, um, in uh, Singapore. And uh, Bishop, we were getting ready to go to a session. I'm standing up, and we were like on the 15th floor or something of this hotel. And when we started going there, we'd stayed in the same hotel every time. And we went there the first time, like two or three years before that, there was, there was, there was a parking garage across from the hotel. There's parking garages and other, some other stuff. And then we, we came back and then we'd gone and, and I got to see it kind of in progress. And then just like two years later, it went from just like some old buildings and parking garage to this, this, sky, this, this skyscraper they were building that had to be at that time I don't even know how many stories it was, but I was standing like on the 15th floor and it was like way beyond what I could see without peering my head kind of against the window. So it had to be 40, 50 stories at the time. And I remember looking at that going, and how in the world, it's amazing how quickly they built that building. It went from just like parking garages when I was here two years ago to this, and it's just a matter of time. And then they were building that building at such a high rate of speed. And then I began to, to think, what would it have been like trying to build that 150 years ago? How long would it take, it take forever? I mean, the, the pulley systems, trying to get all this stuff up to those, and they've got these modern cranes and all this modern equipment. 
and, and in that process, it was like God began to, it was almost like I was having this sort of this, this vision as I'm watching all this. And then God, I began to think, you know, I hear all the, the stories. I've, I've, I've heard them. I've heard stories from, from my father, my bishop for my entire life. And I hear all the stories of all the stuff that he's done and all the stuff. And I'm like, my goodness. I mean, if, if I start now I, and I'm like, I, I'll never even come close. I'll just, he's, I just, but the Lord began to, to show me that what he was doing as he gave some the revelation, they were going to pass on to us the acceleration. That we are not going to have to go dig to get the same revelation because he gave them revelation so he could pass for us acceleration. So I'm saying this in the Holy Ghost that some of you go, wow, man, I don't know if I'm able to get all this. It's just so much. No, no, no. Don't you don't realize God's not asking you to go give it. He's going to begin to share it with you. If you receive it in the spirit, not intellectually, but in the spirit, it's going to come through acceleration because God's not asking you to go find it. He's going to say, here it is. Now, what are you going to do about it? And that's what the next couple of days is for. Would you stand and just lift your hands to the Lord? I believe this is not something that can just be done in the moment. It's not an emotional response. I'm not expecting us to come to the altar tonight, pound the, pound the ground and saying, oh God, oh God, oh God. That's not this. This is, this is a decision that, that needs to be made on a personal level. Maybe tonight when you're in your, wherever you're staying, you're saying, oh, you're going back to your house, wherever you're staying. It's got to be a personal. In the morning when you get up, this needs to be something that needs to be made in your own garden. This is not a temple decision. This is a garden decision. This is where you need to go to your garden and you need to say, you know what? Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. If that's, you got to find your garden tonight in the morning and just say, God, I just want to remind you. You know what? If you have another plan besides this cup thing, I'm open to it. But if that's not the case and you brought me here for this moment, not my will, but thine be done. In the name of Jesus, Father, I have spoken what you've given me to speak i have tried to obey every single word that is spoken that it comes from you and not from me father i pray in the name of jesus take dominion and authority over the spirit of religious tradition i take the authority over the blindness of methodology and i speak revelation would enter into this room it would start even now god as you've already begun to speak but more importantly god that the hunger of those in this room would cry out to you and say, okay, God, we don't want to make a Barabbas mistake, but God, we want you in your way. In the name of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. I praise you, God. Let us give us ears to hear what you're saying. Let us hear with the, with the ears of the Spirit, not try to hear intellectually, but hear spiritually. See with our spiritual eyes. Hear with our spiritual ears. Father, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I know some of you know this, but for those who do not, this is not a church service. This is not a conference. Those words bring expectations of certain things. That's not what this is. This ministry in these meetings is not inspiration. It's not inspiration. We've got all the inspiration we need. We have conference after conference. And rah, rah, sis, boom, bah. Go church, go Jesus. Not trying to be unkind, but I just, I've had all that I can take. I can't take any more of that. It's like a 
piece of paper laying on a highway and semi comes along the turbulence from that semi causes that paper to go up in the air and it floats around whatever when that semi goes past the turbulence begins to calm down and that paper settles back down where it was or close by and i've seen that happen over and over and over again Romans chapter 12 says, you're not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that Greek word's not talking about your brain. It's talking about your thinking. Change takes place by changing of thinking. The word repent doesn't have emotion involved in the word. Godly sorrow may work repentance, but it's not repentance. The word repentance in the Greek literally means a change of mind, a change of direction. There's too many people that weep and don't change because they don't change their mind. They're too involved with emotion, and it never gets beyond emotion to where their mind is changed. It's not the purpose of these meetings. It's not the purpose of these meetings. The purpose of these meetings is to uh, let the Lord speak to our spirits, of course, but to our minds to bring illumination, revelation, whatever. So uh, I pray that you receive this. If you're able to come back tomorrow, we will start exactly at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning, 7 o'clock tomorrow night, 10 a.m. on Saturday morning. If you're able to be in any of this, we do have uh, Zoom links. We have uh, last year, yeah, there's 15 different individual Zoom connections. They're still there. I guess that's a good sign, huh? <laughs> I haven't gotten off yet, so. Okay, but uh, so it's been said, I'll say it one more time. We, we, we really need to lay ourselves before the Lord and say, okay, do I want part truth or do I want all truth? He promised us he would guide us into all truth. Truth is far more than just salvation doctrine. Truth is far more than just Godhead doctrine. Truth is, all truth affects every area of our lives, everything. God has a truth that affects every area of our life. And if we want to be guided into that truth, he promised he would do that. Praise God. I will say this to you one more time. Uh, if you did not hear me in the beginning, I am not physically able to hang around and be the last one out of the building, not come back tomorrow and do what I've got to do tomorrow and Saturday. So I beg of you to not be offended by the fact that I'm going to get my stuff to go to the room. I just... I have, uh, you know, <laughs> the Lord, uh, I've taught it for years now, but, you know, Paul had to go through what he went through because the Lord said that his strength was made perfect in weakness. So I've prayed this numerous times in the last five months. Lord, I'm about as strong as I've ever been. <laughs> uh, literally. Because, <laughs> whoa, it's um, just, I really haven't considered myself an old man until the last five months. I'm hoping it doesn't last. I hope I get past that again and can walk like I did just five months ago. Because right now, whoo, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's very uh, difficult. I tell you one thing I did say to the Lord, and I have done that. 
I thank God that he didn't feel the need to test me with boils from head to toe. So with all the stuff I've gone through, not much, not much of a challenge compared to boils from head to toe. So I'll, I, I'll take that. I'm not complaining. I thank you. Thank you, Lord, for that. Praise God. Father, we love you. We thank you for this privilege. We thank you for all you've done. We thank you for what you're going to do. But this is your kingdom, God, not ours. This is your church, not ours. And you're the one that's paid all the price to try to reach these souls and save them. Father, in your name, in Jesus' name, I'm asking you to bring us to the place where we can truly give ourselves to you and to your way in the name of Jesus. Amen. One last thought you can think of before you go home. You know, in Isaiah 55, when it says that the Lord's ways are above our ways, and his thoughts are above our thoughts, as high as the heaven is above the earth. I got to studying those ways and thoughts things. And uh, one of those means purposes, and the other means methods. His, his purposes and his methods are high as the heavens are above the earth over ours. Not just his thoughts, but his methods. Praise God. The Lord bless you. Thank you for being here.